Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I, I feel slightly sort of anxious, and I'm going to try and do this. I'm, I've brought my notes on, and I hope that's okay. Um, I like the idea of trying to do a bit of a stand-up routine if I'm doing a talk. Not that I can actually really see any of you very well. Um, but I've got my notes because it, I, I'm, I might possibly have that sort of brain-reduced to size of P syndrome. And if I don't have it, then I suddenly completely forget what I'm talking about. And the other issue for me around my anxiety, other than that I'm going to move around a bit because that's how I manage it, is, um, I, I don't know if you know that, but if you're under stress or trauma, uh, the part of the brain that mediates time completely closes down. So it's quite possible for me to be talking for about an hour and think, hey, I've only just started. <laughs> and you guys, are, you know, someone will be trying to get me off stage and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so I, I wonder if you have any idea what I'm, I'm going to be talking about. I'm an addiction specialist. Um, the addictions field is really quite exciting at the moment. It, all, it used to be all about just sort of alcohol and drugs. Um, it's now about a whole lot of other things. And I'm going to talk to you about um, a, a something, an addictive process, which is part of what we call the financial disorders. I'm going to talk about under-earning and under-achieving. Now, actually, not everybody who under-earns or under-achieves is an addict, but I want to suggest to you that there are some people for whom actually this becomes an addictive process. And it'd be interesting to see, you know, to what extent you, 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 you agree with me. But, you know, under-earning under <laughs> is about the inability to really earn what we deserve. It's despite the desire, the effort, the opportunity, um, the uh, qualification, it's about somehow, it's about turning our backs on money and opportunities for money. It's not about, um, I'm not talking about people who've suffered from recession, people who've had bad luck, people who live in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm talking about something that has nothing to do with circumstance, but actually everything to do with what happens inside our, br our, our brains. Now, the field of addiction, one of the things that's really exciting is that we know an awful lot now about sort of neuropsychology. So we have quite a lot of information about the interaction between chemicals and brain. We've also had opportunities to study people in recovery from addiction who have these longitudinal studies and to start seeing what happens. Historically, when we've talked about addiction, we've been thinking about alcohol and drugs, haven't we? We've been talking about people who are using mood-altering chemicals by way of ingestion. Um, they're using them intravenously. They're inhaling them. They're using them transdermally to change the way that they feel. What we know about addiction is that it's genetically proposed, it's environmentally disposed. We know addiction is enormously self-centred. We know that addiction begins with a search for pleasure and ends up with an escape from reality. What we know about addiction is it's self-centred, um, it's willful, um, and it's inconsiderate. We know particularly about addiction in terms of willpower. We know that willpower is about as effective with addiction as it would be with the measles. You know, so we're talking about a concept of powerlessness. And we've been treating since the 50s, people have been getting into recovery from alcohol and then um, um, other drug um, addictions. But what's started to happen in the last sort of 10 years or so is that we've been seeing people coming into clinics who either have once been addicted to drugs and alcohol um, and have started to produce or starting to present with problems that actually also look a bit like addiction, but they're not taking any drugs or alcohol. And we're also seeing people coming in who've never had drug and alcohol problems particularly, but actually presenting with um, other difficulties. And what we call these other addictions process addictions. These are behaviours that interact um, behaviours that interact with brain chemicals to uh, produce a mood-altering feeling. So these are behaviours which, in a sense, people become their own drug dealers. And the sort of th things that I'm talking about might be, um, particularly, you think about the eating disorders, compulsive overeating, which very much, actually, is about that white powder called sugar. People forget. It's a white powder, like heroin or cocaine, compulsive overeating. Um, uh, uh, bulimia, anorexia nervosa, 
the compulsive avoidance of food, the preoccupation and all the adrenaline that goes with avoiding. The most exciting eating disorder that you may know about is orthorexia. I don't know if you've heard about that. Orthorexia is the unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. It's the pathological control over what I eat and when. You know, it's the sort of, it's the counting of the almonds on my porridge. It's the sort of, I've got to sort of eat in this certain way. So we start to see people presenting with these things that actually, of course, and, and eating disorders have been around for a long time, and we think, yeah, they have some sort of addictive quality. We then think about what we're calling the sex and love addictions or the relationship addictions, that there are some people who are just forever being attracted to people that actually somehow are unavailable to them, who really get off on the feeling of the chase and the feeling of falling in love. Thanks to neuropsychology, we actually know that the feeling of falling in love, it's the same part of the brain, it's called the VTA, that lights up when you take cocaine. You know, and that's just how it is for everybody. That's why there's a sort of a high, and it's why some people really like it. But what we tend to see with some people is actually become quite addicted to that, but particularly addicted to finding people that are just not going to be available for them. Um, the sex addictions, a lot of people think sex addiction is something rather exciting. Um, actually, it's really not when you sit in clinic. It's not about having a lot of sex and having a big smile on your face. <laughs> you know, actually, you know, it, it tends to be about, it's often about having sex with yourself. You know, we're talking about pornography, prostitution, some of the paraphilias, but a whole bunch of things that again become actually addictive disorders. And then we start to talk about the financial addictions, of which gambling has been around and has been seen as an addiction for some time. But also, we're talking about compulsive spending and the title of this talk, Under Earning. And compulsive spending, as you probably know, is, um, is actually, compulsive spending is compulsive wanting. It's the inability to turn, turn down a good deal. It's the going into boots for a toothbrush and coming out with a whole store. It's the sort of uh, inability to delay gratification. You know, that's what it, you know, that's what it's about. Uh, compulsive spenders have a motto of like, but, um, I'll buy now, I'll work it out later. You know, and so we're seeing people who've maxed out their credit cards, they've got other credit cards, they're getting loans. It becomes a whole secret, you know, a whole secret thing of compulsive spending. And what I'm going to suggest to you when I talk about the under-earning is that under-earning is the anorexia, if you like, of compulsive spending. It's the determination, the compulsion to keep ourselves small, to stay under the radar, to not be visible, despite having a desire to be successful, despite having the ability to, perhaps having opportunities, um, having the training. It's a compulsion to keep ourselves small. And it's, it, it, it is quite a problem for people. Now, just quickly, a few things about, um, a, 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 about addiction. When we're diagnosing addiction, we're looking for certain criteria. We look for things like preoccupation. So if you think about alcohol and drug addiction, preoccupation would be, yeah, I can't stop thinking about it. I wake up in the morning thinking about having a drink. I go to bed thinking I've got to be stoned before I go to bed. Um, I don't get the weekends off. There's no bank holidays. It's a full-time job. I just keep thinking about it. We think about tolerance, where somehow I need to take more of the same thing in order to feel better. You know, what was maybe 10 milligrams of, of, of diazepam last week actually needs to be 20. What was, a, you know, what was half a bottle of wine a day seems to be a bottle a day. You know, the increase in tolerance. We talk about loss of control. Once I start, I can't, when am I going to stop? You know, I went out for a few drinks, but I didn't come back for three days. <laughs> you know. There's, um, we talk about failed attempts to control. I really want to stop. I'm going to do that. I'm going to switch from spirits to alcohol. I'm going to get rid of all my dealers' names from my, um, you know, from my phone. You know, then I can't do it. I'm going to throw my needles away. You know, you get the idea. It's like I'm determined to stop, but somehow, after a short period of time, there's a sense of withdrawal, and these are unsuccessful attempts to control. And we also look, when we're diagnosing addiction, um, for an impact on, on functioning. So we start to think about the health problems, which are really quite obvious, again, with the alcohol and drugs. Um, you know, there's all sorts of risks, hepatitis C, HIV. We're talking about cirrhosis of the liver. We're talking about what we call wet brain. You know, there's all sorts of things. We talk about the legal problems, uh, the relational problems that people get into. Um, because the thing about addiction is that it is anti-intimacy. 
you know, the people who suffer from addiction aren't, um, we're not talking about bad people or weak people, but we're talking about people for whom the values that they have, the things that they hold important, come second, are always trumped by the desire to change the way that they feel. So let's just talk about under-earning um, for a bit, and I'm, gonna re I'm just going to quickly refer to my notes, if I can possibly manage that. Um, and I'm going to tell you about some of the symptoms of under-earning. So again, it's about compulsively not generating enough money in order to keep ourselves, despite having the ability, having the desire, having the effort, and having the opportunity. So some of these symptoms, and these are symptoms of turning, this is turning your back on money. So I'm suggesting that this is like an anorexia, if you like, um, of the financial disorders, the anorexia that goes um, with compulsive spending. So it might be not asking for a raise, um, you know, or uh, advertising for a job that's desired, even though that job, or, or applying rather for a job that's been advertised, even though that's desired. So putting up with um, a job, but actually just not asking for what one wants, working below one's um, ca um, capacity or education. Rejecting ideas. Most people have ideas most days about um, you know, something that they could do to improve their lives, but most people don't do anything about it. Many people have people that say, why don't you do this? Or I've got, you could talk to so-and-so. I know somebody who could help you with this. But many people don't do anything about that. Now, just because you don't do anything about it, it doesn't mean that you're an addict. But for some people, actually, this continues over and over. They're compulsively not following up these things. Working below one's training, avoiding earning. We've had people coming to clinic. Maybe this is relevant for you guys. We've had people coming who are considering doing their third PhD rather than getting a job. Because somehow it's a way to just sort of avoid being out there in the world and, and earning some money. Um, people who invest more time than they need to in tasks to say, look, we're going to pay you to do this for half a day and they spend the whole day doing it. Not following up if you're self-employed, a classic sign of under-earning would be not following up leads. The phone goes, somebody says, look, actually, I quite like the product or service that you have, and it's somehow, I think I'll get back to them tomorrow. You know, I'll just, let's sort of do it later, rather than actually just following those things up. Not charging appropriately, so undercharging, undervaluing. Again, we're seeing people who, who do work and then don't send an invoice out, or having sent an invoice, don't chase up the money. You know, so actually, a year later, it becomes almost embarrassing to say, can you please pay me for what we did in July 2010, you know? <coughs> Particularly overdoing um, volunteering activities. That is something, it's a classic sign, really, of the under-earning. Rather than earning money, I'm going to volunteer, I'm going to overdo that. People often choosing to work alone rather than working with others when it might actually make sense to have associates and colleagues. You know, for, for many people, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, but people that working alone, doing all the jobs, again, stopping these opportunities for money coming in. Um, clutter is a very classic symptom, again, of people who suffer from under-earning. We know a tidy desk is a tidy mind, but, you know, clutter and not valuing your workspace, you know, holding on to possessions, having things that, in a way, get in the way of actually getting on and being and, and getting jobs done. Time deflection is a classic as well. By time deflection, I mean putting off what must be done and not spending enough time focused on visions and goals. So suddenly, I have a report to write and it seems like a good idea to tidy my kitchen. Do you know? Or let's particularly clean out this cupboard that my wife's never seen me clean out before. But somehow, rather than actually getting on, this time deflection, this not spending time, actually focusing on visions and goals. Chronic lateness is another thing that we see. Chronic lateness. And chronic lateness actually is, is slightly like sort of workaholism. Um, because it, if you're chronically late, you're forever producing adrenaline and cortisol, thinking, God, I've got to get here on time. God, will I make it? Will I make it? Shall I ring them? What will happen? All the time that's happening, it gets in the way of creativity. And actually, workaholism, workaholism is a really interesting addiction, because actually, again, it sounds like one of those things that would be quite cool to have. You know, particularly if you're someone who has trouble getting out of bed, you think, God, wouldn't it be great to be workaholic? But actually, workaholic is an addiction to busyness. You know, it's about the management of anxiety by just by being busy, having a product saying, as soon as I've done this, everything will be okay, but as soon as that project ends, it's not. It's an addiction to, to busyness. 
So again, you become your own dealer, producing anxiety, well, adrenaline um, and cortisol. Behind all of this are some negative cognitions. That's what sort of underpins this whole thing. Because actually, you know, people behave like this in this way um, for a reason. Now, everybody has a bit of it. It's a bit like if you're an addict, if you think about it, addiction's on a spectrum. At one end, you might have somebody who's completely teetotal. You might, on the other end, have somebody who's just drinking every day in the mornings and you're quite clear that they'd be an alcoholic. Most people are somewhere in the middle. It's a bit of problematic drinking, that sort of thing. So I'm certainly, in talking to you about some of these things, it's some of you are probably nodding and thinking, gosh, I'm a bit like that. This is not necessarily diagnosing addiction. But for some people, this becomes really quite compulsive. But what's behind this? So we think about under-earning being this turning our back on money and opportunities to be the person that we want to be. Most of us want to be, we'd like to be fairly rich and famous. We'd like to be prosperous, certainly, and successful. So despite the desire, there's this internal conflict that says, I really want this, but I can't possibly have it. And what's behind it are some core beliefs. One of, these core, one of these core beliefs is that many people have is that I can't really manage on my own anyway. I won't really manage. You know, the only way I'm really going to be successful is if I have a sort of a windfall, somebody pays for me, um, you know, there's a miracle. But the other really big cognition that people have that stops them achieving despite the fact that they want to, that they might be qualified, they might have the opportunity, okay, they might have the desire, what stops them it's concerns about what we call visibility issues. A feeling that if I'm visible, I'm vulnerable. If I stand out, I won't be safe. I'll be challenged, I'll be criticised. And for many people, criticism is perceived as a threat. So these visibility issues, very often, these are a consequence of some form of abuse or, or bullying. Some experience early in life that actually has people feeling like, actually, I can't really stand out. Now, the thing about the human brain is you probably know, unlike the computer, it starts working before it's built. So that actually, experience is the architect of the brain. If you have an early experience, if you're abused in one way or another, if you're bullied, if something happens and actually you're made a fool of, these things, these early experiences become part of the sort of the factory setting of the brain. And they get believed and they're held here in the limbic brain. Not in the frontal cortex. It says, wait a minute, that was then, this is now, I can get on and do things. They're held in the limbic brain. It's the same part of the brain that if the man-eating tiger enters the room, it says, get out. Whereas, you know, the frontal cortex might say, nice stripes. Yeah? It's the bit that kicks in first. And that is the problem here. So for some people, they have these issues around visibility that have them compulsively avoiding opportunities for prosperity and success despite the fact that they would really like to be prosperous and successful. We can treat this in the same way that we treat any other addiction. Now, this isn't somebody, if you're not an addict, you might do something, you might not follow up a lead and then think, God, that was a bit stupid because nothing happened. I won't do that again. If you suffer from addiction, it's compulsive. It's like you continue to do something despite knowledge that it's not in your best interest to do so. We can treat this in the same way. The aim, the goal of recovery from compulsive under-earning is not actually to be rich or famous or necessarily prosperous or successful. That does happen. But actually the real goal is to be able to do something that people, a lot of these people haven't been able to do before, which is to take care of themselves, to be able to act in our best interests, to be free to do what we want to do. So that actually if you've got a PhD and you're doing a manual job, and, uh, you know, if, you d if you're in recovery, that's cool because that's what you've chosen to do. If you're compulsive uh, under earner, you might have a PhD, but actually you can't possibly really take your place in the world and do that. You need to do something that keeps you invisible. Um, recovery, you know, this, I believe that this, this is an illness. We can treat it in the same way as any other addiction. It is the anorexia of the financial disorders, of financial addictions. Recovery is possible. Um, I hope that's made sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.